All right, now in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, there's all kinds of stuff in here we can preach on, and there's a lot of references to the resurrection, and of course, this morning, is, we're, we're celebrating Easter, it's Easter Sunday, um, a lot of people will tell you that it's, you know, it's pagan, and it's pagan roots, and all this other stuff, now, when we celebrate Easter as Christians, we're not celebrating, you know, the Easter bunny, that's not what we're celebrating, we're celebrating the fact that Jesus Christ died on the cross, right, and Three days later, he rose again from the dead. And this is that day that we choose to celebrate, the, the, the day that Jesus Christ has risen again from the dead. And of course, that's what Easter is all about. Now, what I want to preach on this morning, I'm going to preach all about this subject, but the title of my sermon is, What Does the Bible Really Say? And, and I hear that this is the slogan that the Jehovah's Witnesses are using. They've been going out. See, they have this big push at Easter time. They, were, they came out on my street twice. Um, just in the past few weeks, they go out and they just invite people to church. They have this really big push on Easter. And it's kind of ironic if you know exactly what they believe. I'm going to expose some of the false doctrines that they, that they teach and they believe, along with some other ones. Because I want to, eat, like, if you go to the Jehovah's Witnesses, they're going to, they're, they have their big slogans, what does the Bible really say? Well, if you go to them and get, to try to get answers, you're not going to get the truth. They believe all kinds of false doctrine, all kinds of false heresy. I'm going to expose some of that to you this morning from the Bible about why it's false. I'm not just going to rattle my cage and say, they're wrong, I'm right. We're going to say, no, what they believe is wrong because this is what the Bible says, because the Bible contradicts what they say. That's why it's wrong. It has nothing to do with like, oh, I don't like those guys, or I hate those guys, or anything like that. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the fact that, first of all, they preach a false gospel, that you have to do works in order to be saved. And we know that salvation comes by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not based on your good works. It's not how good of a person you are. You're saved by one time putting your faith in Christ and trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the most important thing. Now, Easter and the resurrection is extremely important because this is part of the gospel. This is a, like what you have to believe in order to even be saved. You have to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the Jehovah's false witnesses, I don't like calling them Jehovah's witnesses because the name of God, one of God's name is Jehovah. They're not witnesses of Jehovah. They're Jehovah's false witnesses. They're out bringing a false gospel. And they, you know, they do this big push, they hand out flyers trying to tell you that they know what the Bible really says, but that they're not going to be able to give you that truth. Let's look at the Bible here. See, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse number 1, it says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand. And then jump down to verse number 3. <coughs> it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. So in verse 1, he's saying that he declared unto them the gospel, and in verse 3 explains what that is. He says, he delivered unto them what he also received because he needed to receive this to be saved. Christ, he died for our sins according to scriptures. That's what he did. He died to be the payment for our sins. He was buried. They buried his physical body in the ground. And then it says he rose again the third day from, according to the scriptures. He physically rose again from the dead. His body came out of the grave and he, and he walked around and, and, you know, he literally, physically rose again from the dead. Now, it's extremely important. The reason why I bring this up is because the, the, the Jehovah's False Witnesses, they don't believe in that resurrection part. Now, they do believe there's a resurrection. So when you go up there and say, you don't believe in the resurrection, they'll say, oh, yes, we do. We believe there's a resurrection. But what, but what I'm referring to when I say they don't believe in that resurrection, they don't believe that Jesus Christ's body physically, physically rose from the dead. They believe that it was just a spiritual resurrection. They don't believe that his body physically arose. Now, we're going to see lots of evidence in the Bible that points completely to the contrary, to the point where you think that you're nuts to think that he didn't actually physically rise again from the dead, because it's all throughout Scripture. And again, I'm not doing this just to be mean against some group and just have this axe to grind with them. It's because they're teaching false doctrine, and they're out, and they're trying to deceive people, and they're twisting Scripture, and they're going around doing the work of the devil. I'm going to call it what it is. Because they have a false gospel and they don't even believe what you need to believe to be saved, which is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He physically rose from the dead. Now, if we're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse number 11. It says, Therefore, whether 
whether it were I or they, so we preach and so ye believed. Verse 12, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God. And I believe that this is exactly what the Jehovah's Witnesses are. They are false witnesses of God. It says, uh, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. Ye are yet in your sins. If you don't believe that Jesus Christ, his body physically arose from the grave, you're yet in your sins. And they don't believe that. He physically arose. Now, um, turn, if you would, to John chapter 2. Because now we're going to start seeing some more evidence to the fact that Jesus Christ physically rose from the, dead, from the dead. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John in the New Testament. John is the fourth book of the New Testament. John chapter number 2. We're going to see some evidence that Jesus Christ's body physically rose from the, from the dead. John chapter 2. Look at verse number 18, if you would. John chapter 2. The Bible reads, Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? So see, Jesus said, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. They didn't understand what he was talking about. These people weren't saved. They didn't get what he was saying. They're thinking he's talking about the holy temple, you know, the temple where they worship God. And they're saying, wait a minute, you know, it took them 46 years to build this temple. You're going to do it in three days by yourself. They didn't understand what he was saying. Verse 21 explains it for us, though. It says, but he spake of the temple of his body. So right there, Jesus Christ, the Bible says he was referring to his own body. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Which is exactly what happened. When Jesus Christ was crucified, when they nailed his body to the cross, when they whipped him, when they beat him up, when they stuck that crown of thorns on his head, when they spit on him, they mocked him, and they nailed him to the cross, they destroyed his body. His body died. They destroyed it. But what happened three days later? He raised it up. Three days later, he his body rose again from the dead. And John 2.21 says specifically that he spake of his body. Not another body, not someone else's body, not his spirit. It says his body. Verse 22, it says, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. So they didn't, they didn't quite get it until later. After, after he rose again from the dead, they remembered that he said that. And they're like, oh man, yeah, remember when he said that? He said, that, you know, destroy this temple in three days, I'll, I'll raise it up again. That's what he was talking about. And they finally got the understanding after he actually rose again from the dead. Now turn, if you would, please, to Luke 24. It's right before the, the book of John. There's a few pages over in your Bible. Luke 24, a few pages to the left. Luke chapter 24. Here's just another proof, and here's proof that it's his same body, because he, again, one of the lies of the Jehovah's Witness, I'll tell you, to say that, oh, well, he did appear in a body, but it wasn't his body. Like, it was just a different body. Like, it wasn't the same body that Jesus Christ had, it was just, it was just some different body. Well, we'll see if that even makes sense. Let's look at Luke 24, look at verse number 36. Luke 24, 36 says, and as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. So when they see Jesus, they, think, they thought they saw a spirit. Verse 38 says, And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So first of all, again, he physically rose from the dead. They touched him. Jesus Christ said, look, a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. If you saw a spirit, you know, if it was just a spiritual resurrection, he says, spirit doesn't have flesh and bones. They're, they're more of an apparition. They're, you know, it's something different. Flesh and bones, so that's physical. It's a physical body. He says, handle me. 
and touch me. You know, he's like, just, just feel me. Look, I'm real. I have flesh and bones. Verse 40 says, And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? And they gave him a piece of a broiled fish and of a an honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. So not only did he let them let him touch him, he even sat down and ate food. Okay? Spirits are, they don't have flesh. They're not going to sit down and eat a meal with you. Right? <laughs> Jesus Christ, I mean, this, is, this should be ample proof to show you. Look, Jesus Christ physically rose again from the dead. He came back to life. That's part of the resurrection. It's very clear in the Bible when you just look at these scriptures. And, and does, does anyone think that we're like twisting scripture here or just ripping it out of context? I mean, it's pretty evident, right? This isn't up for interpretation. This is just what happened. I mean, these, we're literally just looking at the words of Jesus Christ and we're looking at the words of the Bible and just taking it for what it says. It doesn't need any extra interpretation on it. It says what it says, and I believe that what, that's what it is. God's not here trying to deceive us and say, oh, I know it says that, but it really means this. That's not the way God operates. Look at John chapter 20, if you would. Again, just flip forward a little bit to John chapter 20. And this is what I was talking about. I jumped ahead of myself when I said, we're going to see if it was the same body. If it was the exact same body or not. Or, or if God's just a deceiver, right? John chapter 20. Look at verse number 24. Now, I don't know. Have any of you heard of doubting Thomas before? Thomas was one of the disciples. And if you ever heard that phrase, doubting Thomas, is because Thomas doubted whenever, when all the other disciples had seen Jesus Christ risen from the dead, he doubted whether or not he actually rose again from the dead. And this is where we're going to see the story of where, where Thomas finally does believe because he actually gets to see him and, and, and hold him and he sees that it's actually true. But um, look at verse number 24. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. He's saying, look, I need to see this. Like, there's no way I'm going to believe that this is actually true unless you actually could just show me this really happened. I could feel, I could put my hand in the holes of his hands and thrust my hand into his side where they pierced them with the spear. He says, then I won't believe Look at verse 26, and it says, And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. There's so much to cover in this one little section of scripture. <coughs> First of all, we see Jesus Christ had a body where he still had holes in his hands from where they nailed him on the cross. And he still had that wound in his side. Now, I don't know about you, but that sounds like the exact same body that he, that he died with. I don't see why God's going to give him a different body, but then say, well, you still have these wounds. That doesn't make any sense, and there's no reason to believe that, that that happened based on what we read in Scripture. I mean, it only makes sense to say, well, of course, it was Jesus Christ who rose again from the dead. We saw in other Scriptures, He physically rose, He bodily arose. So yeah, of course, it was Him. He had the holes in His hands, so He still had the wound in His side. He physically rose again from the dead. It was Jesus Christ's body. And again, there's many things here. Just to completely expose what the you know, Jehovah's Witnesses, another th false belief that they have, and I don't know if it's, if it's unique to them or not, but they also believe that Jesus Christ was not crucified on a cross. Now, you see it all the time, I mean, a lot of churches, and we're never going to do this, but um, you see a lot of churches that use a cross as their symbol because Jesus was crucified on a cross, and I don't have all of the script. There's so many scriptures that say that Jesus was crucified on a cross. First of all, if you just use the word crucified, that word crucified, that root word, cru like cruce, comes from, that means cross. It means you're nailed on a cross. Like um, in Latin it would be crux. The word crux just means cross. Um, crucifixion is all throughout the Bible. It says, it says that Jesus Christ was on a cross. Yet the Jehovah's Witnesses will say, well, he wasn't on a cross. He was actually on a torture stake. So what they believe is that it was really just a stake in the ground 
and his hands were over his head like this, and they nailed him like that. Now, did that happen in the old times? Sure it did. That is something that they did with, with criminals and with people, you know, way back when. But it doesn't mean that that's all they did, and it doesn't mean that they didn't also use crosses to crucify people on. And the Bible says that Jesus was crucified on a cross. Now, we have more evidence still here in Scripture. In verse 25, Thomas was saying, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. Look at both of those are plural. So that means that both of his hands had a hole in them. But not only that, it says the, in his hands the print of the nails. Now, if his hands were, were, were like this over him and he was crucified, how many nails would he need to be, uh, to be nailed to that cross? Just one. It wouldn't be the nails. He would say, except I should see in his hands the print of the nail. Yet, it says it's plural. Now, if it's nails, that means his hands have to be spread apart. Right? Again, it completely lines up with being crucified, with the Bible saying he was on a cross. And again, I believe the translators... In 1611, that translated the Bible into English, and even before that, the words that they used, I mean, the people who translated the Bible were extremely intelligent men. They knew language. They knew language very well. And they chose the words. And I believe that it wasn't just their smarts and their intelligence. I believe God preserved his word for us today to have in 2014 to be able to know what he, what he has for us to say. And I just believe it for what it says because I believe God is involved in preserving his word for us. If it was completely just left up to man, then yes, I believe there's mis there would be mistakes in the Bible. There, you know, We wouldn't be able to do it completely accurate. But if God is with it, if God's hand is with it, then of course it's going to be preserved. And I believe he's done that for us today. And I believe we have that Bible in the English language, in the King James Version of the Bible. We have a Bible that has no errors in it, no contradictions. The true word of God that he has allowed for us to have and he's preserved throughout all generations. I believe he's had the Bible, you know, his word available to people throughout all time, throughout all generations. Because he wants us to know about him. He wants us to have his word. And he's preserved it for us. We're not relying just on man. But see, there's so many reasons just to, to believe this and to see that's true and that this idea of a torture stake is false. And again, another doctrine that they believe, they don't believe that Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. They believe he was just the son of God. They believe that he was just a man, a created being, like God created Jesus Christ, even though the Bible says that he was without mother, without father. Um, having, he's the beginning, he's the ending, Right? He, they don't care about those scriptures. Even in Isaiah, it says that he is the everlasting father. Talking about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the everlasting father. Yet, they don't believe that. They don't believe in the Trinity. They don't believe that the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. They don't believe that. Yet, when Thomas saw Jesus Christ here, in verse 28, it says, when he actually felt the holes in his hands, Thomas answered and said, unto him, my Lord and my God. Now, if Jesus is not God, if he really isn't God, shouldn't Jesus have corrected Thomas and said, wait a minute, Thomas, no, I'm not God. Don't worship me as God because there's only one God. Because that's what the Bible says. The Bible says there's one Lord. The Bible says we should have no other gods before him. If Jesus truly was not God, he should have corrected him there. He should have said no, but he didn't do that. On the contrary, verse 29, what did he say? Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. He's saying, you're right. Because you saw me, you believe that I'm God. Because you saw us. And he says, blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. That's us, my friends. We have not seen Jesus Christ. We did not see his body physically rise from the, from the dead. We did not see the prince in his hands. We didn't see this stuff. Thomas got to see those things. I mean, good for him. He got to see him and, he's, and, and he believed. We don't get to see those. But Jesus says, blessed are they have not even seen, yet they believe. And I believe that to be true. I believe he died, he was hung on a cross, and he rose again from the dead to pay the punishment for our sins. He was God in the flesh. Look, there's so many reasons why that, that Jehovah's false witnesses, I call them Jehovah's false witnesses because they believe these damnable heresies that are literally will be sending people to hell because there's so many aspects. This is the gospel. I mean, this is basic. This is rudimentary. This is what we have to believe in order to be saved. It's very simple. Just the fact that Jesus Christ 
died on the cross, he paid for our sins and rose again from the dead. I mean, the fact that he's God in the flesh is evident. The fact that he physically rose is evident. It's here. And if people go around teaching and say, no, that didn't happen, no, he's not God in the flesh, they're liars. They're deceivers. Now, some of them might have like a, a, a good intention, but they're deceived. Well, I'm not saying every single one of those people just has ill intent and is just wicked in their hearts. Now, some of them are. And I believe especially the, the ones maybe a little bit higher up, the teachers and stuff, I believe that they are the false witnesses, they're, they're teachers. But a lot of them are probably just deceived. The majority of them, I would say, are probably just deceived. I mean, just like so many other false religions that are out there, people are just tricked. They're deceived. They, they, they get sucked into something because they think it's true and it's just a lie. And they've been lied to. I mean, Satan is a great deceiver. And he's the master of telling lies. He's really, really good at it. That's why he gets so many people to get into sin. That's why he gets people following false religion and doing all these different things because he's just he's a, he's a trickster. He's really good at, at telling lies. And again, it's not that I don't want them to get saved. Of course I do. Anyone that believes in any false doctrine, I want them to get saved. I want them to change what they believe and believe the Bible and just believe what it says. But we need to be warned today because they are going out. They are trying to spread this gospel. We need to be warned and, and know for ourselves what does the Bible really say so that you don't get tricked by it. You don't get sucked in by it. Now, that's about it I think I have for the, for the JFWs in this sermon. Now we're going to move on to another, another misconception about, about the resurrection, about Easter. And that's Good Friday. right? Does anyone, does anyone here know what Good Friday is or what it's supposed to mean? Good Friday, at least this is, and this is what I always was taught, up, taught growing up. I was taught that on Good Friday, that's when Jesus was crucified, and then on Easter Sunday, that's when he rose again from the dead. Okay, that's what I was taught. There's a lot of problems with that, though, because the Bible says, for one, that Jesus Christ was in the grave for three days and three nights. Now, between Friday and Sunday, let's count how many days and nights there are. So let's say uh, at Friday... He was, he, was, he was crucified, right? Let's, I'll even give him the whole day and say, okay, Friday. So then you have Saturday, and then you have Sunday, right? Now, the Bible says that as it began to dawn towards the first day, we're going to see that, he was already gone, he was already risen. But even if we gave him Sunday, you could say, okay, you want to stretch it out, you want to use whatever you can to try to twist it, say, there's three days. Okay, well, how do you get three nights? You've got Friday night and Saturday night. He wasn't in the grave on Sunday night. You only got two nights there. At the, I mean, at the, if you want to really stretch it out, I don't even believe you got three days there. But if you really want to stretch it out and, and, and whatever, okay, you got three days and at the most two nights. No way, no possible way Jesus Christ could have been crucified on, a, on that Friday. And again, we're using, we're using our calendar just so that we understand this. I, I understand you can say, oh, well, their first day of the week was, you know, whatever. We're, we're using what we understand Sunday through Saturday. Sunday is the first day of the week. Saturday is the last day of the week. This is what we understand. This help you understand. Um, if it was using our calendar when Jesus would have been crucified, it was not on Friday. Now, are you in, we're in John still, right? John 20? Yeah. Turn to John chapter 19. I'm going to read for you from Leviticus 23. Because Leviticus 23 talks about the Passover. Now, the Passover is extremely relevant with Easter and the resurrection. The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Now, if you remember in the Old Testament, when the children of Israel were in bondage in Egypt, they were, they were slaves, they were being treated terribly. Um, that was when Moses came and he rose up to deliver the people of, of Israel out of Egypt. And he went to Pharaoh, and he's like, Pharaoh, you know, you got to release my people. you got to let my people go. we got to go serve the Lord. we got to go do this. And God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and that's when he brought all the plagues. I don't know if you remember, there was, you know, the locusts and the lice and, and um, the hail, and he turned the, the water into blood. He did all these different miracles, all these things to Pharaoh to show him, look, look, let us go. The last thing that he did was, was God told Moses, he said, okay, Here's what you have to do. For each family has to kill a lamb. You have to sacrifice the lamb, and you have to take the blood thereof. You have to take that blood of the lamb, and you have to put it on the posts of your door. He says you have to, you have to put it on each side post and on, and on the top. And he was going to send an angel of death throughout, throughout the land, and every firstborn son was going to die. 
unless you put that blood on your door of your house. He says, if you put the blood on your house, I'm going to pass over you. So that was called the Passover. And Passover, we're going to see, this is really amazing how, how Easter and, and Jesus Christ's resurrection lines up perfectly with the Passover and, and how, that, how Jesus fulfilled and completely represents that lamb that was slain to provide salvation because they received salvation. Their sons didn't die when that blood was shed over their doors. The same way that you don't die when you get the blood of Jesus Christ on you to wash away your sins. It's great imagery and it's great teaching that God gave them in the, in the Old Testament. He taught them a little bit differently with some of these sacrifices and the symbology and, and the things that they had to understand and to learn that there was a Savior. Now, they didn't know him by Jesus Christ. We know him by name today. But it's the same thing. And, uh, so I'm going to read for you what some of the rules were for Passover. Leviticus 23, verse 5 says, In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. So the first month for them in their calendar, on the 14th day, two weeks into that month, the 14th day, he says, that's the Passover. This is when you're going to celebrate the Passover. It says, And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So now you have the 14th day is Passover. Then the 15th day starts a feast of unleavened bread. And that lasts seven days. So he says, okay, you have the 14th and the 15th are both very special days, right? And then it says, in the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. He said, you can't do any work. Now, if you're familiar in the Bible, there, you know, there's seven days in a week. And the Sabbath is the seventh day. It's called a Sabbath of rest. Every week, the children of Israel were not supposed to do any work on the Sabbath. They were supposed to keep the Sabbath. They were supposed to do no work. Anything that they had to do on, on that Saturday, they would have to get ready the day before. They were not allowed to do any work. It was a day of rest. There were also days that were called Sabbaths that were special holy days. So like the Passover, this feast would be days where, hey, you had to be prepared because you can't do any work on those, on those special days that God has picked out in addition to, to just every Saturday, right? These were special days that happened a few times in the year where God ordained these feasts and these special holy days. He said, okay, these are also very holy. They're special days. You, I don't want you doing any work. He says, you need to rest. And there's a good reason for that. I'll get to that in a minute. So if you're in John chapter 19, look at verse number 14. It says, And it was the preparation of the Passover. And about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. This is when Jesus Christ was, was being tried. Right? They delivered Jesus Christ up. Pilate's got him. And, you know, he's already beaten him up. And he says, Behold your king. But in verse 14 it says, It was the preparation of the Passover, which means they were preparing to get the lamb ready, they were getting, they were being prepared not to do any work the next day. They were getting everything in order. as the preparation day to be ready for the Passover, which is this day that Jesus Christ is being tried. Verse 15, it says, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. Then delivered he to him, Therefore, unto them to be crucified, and they took Jesus and led him away. So there we're seeing, again, the timing from the Bible saying that was a preparation day. The next day is the Passover. Mark 15, 42, you don't have to turn there. It says, and now when the even was come, because it was the preparation, that is the day before the Sabbath. Again, this is, this is a, a parallel passage to what we saw here in John in Mark 15. Just, you know, just I want to point out and prove it to you. Okay, this is the preparation day. This is before the Sabbath. Jesus was killed, we could gain from the scriptures that he was killed at even, right around evening time, okay? And here's another important aspect, I'm not going to get into this too deep, um, I don't have all the evidence for me, but the Bible, when the Bible talks about days and nights, or, or days in the Bible, um, the day starts in the evening, like the next day. So we have a day, you know, the way we do our calendar, at midnight is the next day, right? So today's um, April 20th. Right at midnight tonight, that's when April 21st starts. It's just in the middle of the night. Well, with them, if you think about it this way, instead of being in the middle of the night, they just had it start a little bit earlier. Just flip the cosplay. So when the sun goes down, you know, right around 6 o'clock, that would start the next day instead of waiting, you know, an extra six hours till midnight. 
They just had it say, okay, well, this is when the, when the new day starts. And in the Bible, you see in, the, in, the, in Genesis 1, it says in the evening and the morning were the first day. You know, starting with the evening and then the morning, like that's, that's the first day. That's kind of how they, they, they just gauge their time. So the evening of the day when Jesus Christ was crucified, at that even, that started the Passover. Okay? That's when it, it would literally begin was after, as soon as the sun goes down, hey, now the Passover has started because it's the next day. Does that make sense? And when you look through the Bible, you see that Jesus Christ died right around, he, like right at evening time. Now the next day after the Passover was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when Jesus was crucified, the day after that was the regular Sabbath. And it's amazing how God orchestrated everything to work out for the three days and the three nights that Jesus Christ was in the grave. Nobody was doing any work because the first day that he died was the Passover. The Passover, they had to do the preparation. They couldn't do any work. Well, the next day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They was also commanded they couldn't do any work on that day. And God worked it out so that if you think in our, in our terminology, in our, in our days, right, Wednesday would have been the day that he was brought before Pilate. Wednesday night would have been the day that um, he was killed. Because Wednesday, the, our Wednesday night would be starting there Thursday, right? So he died. It would be Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday. Saturday is the Sabbath. Uh, Thursday and Friday would be the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Those were both holy days. Those were both sanctified. They could not do any work. They couldn't do any work on the Sabbath. And by the first day of the week, he was risen again from the dead. Look at Matthew 28, the first book of the New Testament. There's a few chapters back, a few books back. Matthew 28, the last book of Matthew, last chapter of Matthew, sorry, Matthew 28, because we'll see this. So for all three days, Jesus Christ was in the grave. He was doing the work required for our salvation. We're going to get to that in just a second. No one else was allowed to do any works. And again, I just emphasize, and God just putting that emphasis on, look, you cannot work your way to heaven. You can't do it. No, the, the whole time Jesus was in the grave, nobody was supposed to be doing any work. He was paying for our sins. He was the one securing our place in heaven while he was dead. Now, look at verse 1 of Matthew 28. It says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. So verse 1 says that it was the end of the Sabbath. And they, they were there before dawn. It wasn't even dawn yet. So it says, you know, it began to dawn towards the first day of the week. So by the time the Sunday rolled around, he was already gone. He has already been risen. The angels just came to show him, like, look, we opened up the door. He's not here. He's already risen. He's gone. It's already happened. So by the time Sunday even rolls around, he's already risen, Right? Now, we don't know exactly when that happened, you know, some point on, you know, on Saturday night or whatever, but we know that he was in a grave for three days and three nights because that's what the Bible says. And um, turn, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. But it's amazing to me that Jesus Christ, he, you know, he did all the works for us. And, and if you think about this, see, this is the last, the last, um, the last false doctrine, the last, the last misconception that I want to that I want to deal with this morning, as far as Easter and the resurrection is concerned, is the fact that Jesus Christ actually literally went to hell for those three days and the three nights that he was dead. It wasn't just that his body was in the grave. It's like where did his soul go? I mean, some people say, well, his soul went to heaven. That's not true. Jesus Christ's soul went to hell. And if you think about it, just, just logically, it makes sense. The Bible says that Jesus Christ bare the sins of the whole world in his own body. It says that he bare our sins. 
Now, if the punishment for our sins when we die, if we don't have Christ, is to go to hell to pay for them, doesn't it only just make sense that if Jesus had our sins, he went to hell and paid for our sins in hell? I mean, it just stands to reason that that happened, but we don't have to just rely on our logic and reasoning to understand that because the Bible says that as well. And if you're in Acts chapter 2, we're going to see the proof of this. Acts chapter 2, look at verse number 25 of Acts chapter 2. It says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the, law, the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life, thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now, this is Peter preaching in the book of Acts, in chapter 2 here, what we just read. He's quoting the Old Testament, he's quoting the book of Psalms. And he's going to explain what this, what this Old Testament scripture means. Look at verse 29. It says, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne, he, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ. He's saying, look, that Psalm, that Old Testament scripture, he says, David was a prophet. He knew that Christ was going to come out of his line, out of his descendancy, out of his ancestors. His David, the seed of David ultimately was going to lead with Jesus Christ, you know, being born um, of the Virgin Mary. Like he didn't know Mary, but he knew that was, he was going to come um, of David's ancestry. And he spake because he was a prophet. This Psalm is in reference to the resurrection of Christ. It says in verse 31, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So right there, Bible saying, look, that psalm is referring to Jesus Christ's resurrection, that his soul, Jesus Christ's soul, was not left in hell. If it's not left in hell, it means it was in hell. That means Jesus Christ's soul was in hell. He said it wasn't left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So while his flesh was in the grave, it didn't, Raw. It, didn't, it didn't come to corruption, right? His flesh stayed the way it was while his, his, his soul was in hell paying for our sins. Now, the Bible says, as I mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Jesus is our Passover. And turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter number 12. Oh, there's my reference. Okay. While you're turning to Exodus 12, the second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter number 12, the Bible also says in Matthew 12, 40, it says, For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Right? So again, there's scripture that says it was three days and three nights, and he's, he's likening it to Jonah. Remember the story of Jonah. Jonah was swallowed by the whale when he was thrown overboard. And he was in that whale's belly for three days and three nights. And in Matthew 12, 4, he says, for the same way that Jonah was in that whale's belly, he says, the Son of Man shall be in the heart of the earth. Now, where's the heart? <coughs> if you think about the heart of the earth, do you think that's just in a grave that's maybe six feet below the, below the, the, the surface? That wouldn't be the heart. That's like the skin. I mean, that's, that's near the top, right? The heart's going to be in the center. Now, even science will tell you what is in the center of our earth. That core is fire. It's, it's hot. It's extremely hot, right? I mean, you see volcanoes shooting up this magma and, and fire and brimstone is coming out of these volcanoes. That stems from down in the lower parts of the earth, right? The Bible says that Jesus Christ was in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. The heart. He was in hell. As Acts 2 said, he was in hell. His soul was not left in hell. He paid for our sins in hell. Before raising again from the dead. Exodus chapter, Exodus chapter 12, we're going to see here a little bit more information on the Passover. This is the last scripture we're going to turn to. I'm almost done. Look at verse number 2 of Exodus 12. It says, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, 
according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. So we're going to start seeing here the resemblance, the likeness of Jesus Christ in what they had to do with their sacrifice, with their lamb sacrifice. Verse 5 says, your lamb shall be without blemish. That means without spot. It, it has to be perfect. There has to be nothing wrong with it. Jesus Christ was sinless. He was perfect. He was that lamb that was <coughs> capable of being accepted and acceptable unto God because he was without blemish. He was perfect. See, you or I, we can't sacrifice ourselves to pay for someone else's sins because we have our own. If we were to offer up and say, God, take me as a sacrifice. I want to pay for Brother Matt's sins. I want to pay for his sins. They say, you can't. You've got your own to pay for. You can't pay for someone else's. You've got your own. We're all sinners. We all have our own. That's why we need Jesus Christ to come and do it for us. He had no sin. He didn't have his own sins. That's why what he did is acceptable. It's acceptable to say, okay, you don't deserve any punishment. You don't deserve anything. You did everything right. If you're going to take their punishment, I'll accept that. Him offering up himself to be that perfect sacrifice. He was without blemish. Look at verse number 6. It says, And ye shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Talking about keeping the lamb, you know, making sure it's perfect without blemish. The fourteenth day of the same month. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. This is really important to notice. This is different than other sacrifices. There's a lot of sacrifices they had in the Old Testament. Lots of, you know, the, the sin sacrifice... Um, a free will offering, all these different types of sacrifices they had. And the book of Leviticus goes over all those. But um, with the Passover lamb, with this sacrifice, it says, the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. Isn't that amazing? It was the whole assembly of Israel, essentially, I mean, it was the Jews that were, were congregated before Pilate that said, crucify him, crucify him. His blood be upon us and on our children. That's what they said. And that was the, the whole, a whole group of people, a whole mob of the Jews saying, crucify him. They delivered Jesus Christ up and he died in the evening. He died in the evening. We, we see the, um, the, and again, I'm not going to get into all the screen. We don't have time to get into all the different, in the Gospels of, of all the, the timeline of events when he was up on the cross, all the things that he said, all the things that happened. But, um, but he ended up dying in the evening. Verse 7 says, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the house wherein they shall eat. And this is kind of interesting. I heard this before, and it kind of makes sense. It says, they shall strike it on the two side posts. So you're going to do this, and on the upper door post. So you think about what kind of symbol would that, you know, is that, is that going to make? Again, a cross. Is, is, that, is that the hardcore evidence that I, that I came out with against, you know, the state? No. But it's interesting. It's, it's, it's just one of those things. It's kind of cool. It's kind of neat to see that. You make that kind of motion, you're going to make a cross, right? I mean, just, just by doing that, by putting the blood on there. Again, I think it's just a foreshadowing and a symbol. You know, that's not what I'm going to use as my concrete evidence to say that Jesus Christ died on a cross, but it's interesting. Um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 8, and this is where I get to about Jesus Christ going to hell. Look at what they were, they made, they made this so clear. Like, like, God wanted to make sure that we don't misunderstand this. In verse number 8, how they had to prepare that sacrifice. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Verse 9, eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head, with his legs, and with the pertinence thereof. And he shall let nothing of it remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, he shall burn with fire. Three times he says, look, you need to make it with fire. It needs to be roast with fire. Don't use water, right? Don't eat it raw. It has to be roast with fire. God, he's, he's hammering it in their head. Say, this, this sacrifice, it has to be roast with fire. He makes it a point in three consecutive verses saying, fire, 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 use fire. And anything that's left over, burn it in the fire. Verse 11 says, and thus shall you eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Jesus Christ fulfilled every aspect of the Lord's Passover. 
It happened on the Passover. This isn't a coincidence. God has a master plan. Jesus Christ walked the exact way that he needed to. All of the events of his life, everything that he did was in God's will, was the way that it was supposed to be done. And in order for this entire orchestration to come together as immensely perfectly as it did, he had to be doing the right thing every step of the way. I mean, think about other outside things that could have happened if he would have just done the wrong thing, if he wasn't doing what God wanted him to do. You know, he could have gotten off path and screwed up the timing. I mean, God timed so many things here together. For him to be, for them to finally come, for Judas to betray him, for him to be arrested, for everything to happen, to be found guilty and to be crucified on the Passover, on that evening just before Passover, and for him to die, to give up his life and die on the Passover, and for that specific year, because you think about it, the 14th day of the month is not going to land on the same day of the week every year. I mean, just like, I mean, today is the 20th, right? Next year, the 20th, will probably be on a Monday. The year after that will be on a Tuesday. The year after that will be on a Wednesday. Well, God worked it out. This year, this time, this is exactly when Christ was supposed to die because he died. No work was going to be done. No work was going to be done. No work was going to be done by anybody else. Jesus Christ was paying for our sins. He did all the work. Everything fit perfectly to plan. And keep that in mind. When you're following God's will, whatever that may be. Now, sometimes His will may not end up being very pleasant. You might have to go through trials. You might have to go through persecutions. You might have to suffer a little bit. Because people will attack you. But if you stick with God's plan, you do everything according to His plan. He knows the end. He knows what's going on. And He knows what you need. That's the place where you need to be. And if you start to veer off and say, you know what? This is too tough. This is too difficult. I'm just going to go somewhere else. You're going to, you can screw up whatever plans that God's had for you ultimately in the end of your life. I mean, Jesus Christ doing all this stuff, he receives the most honor and glory above all. I mean, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. He gets absolutely the most glory. But we also read about men who have followed God and did according to his will who are going to get glory. And I mean, there's a, you're going to receive rewards, you're going to receive treasures, there's going to be all kinds of things you can lay up for yourself in heaven. And if you stick according to God's will, you can, you know, he'll bless you with that stuff. But we need to stay on course. We need to not be, be dissuaded. We need to not let the enemy get us out from serving God. Let's try to let God use us in his perfect plan. I believe God leads us. And there's so many times in my life you don't really understand what's going on. You don't understand why things come your way and why things are going wrong. But then sometimes years later you can look back and be like, oh, that happened as a result. You don't know it when you're going through it. But you can look back if you're doing according to God's will. You can say, that's what God had in store. That's what he had lined up for me. And you can, it's easier always to look back and see how it happened than it is right when you're in the middle of it. That's why we have to have faith during those hard times. We have to trust and just say, you know what? I'm, I know I'm doing what's right according to God's word. I know I'm doing what's right according to the Bible. I'm just going to keep doing it. Keep on the right path. Maybe everything else is going wrong in your life. But don't use that as an excuse. And don't use that as saying, well, I must not be doing something right. Because that's not always the case. Job was a perfect man in God's eyes. I mean, he obviously he was still a sinner, but he was doing the right things. He was living the way he was supposed to be living, yet he had the most complete devastation that, that anybody recorded in the Bible has ever had as far as losing everything. Losing his ten children, losing his finances, getting sick, getting boils, getting all kinds of things wrong happening to him. But he didn't lose his faith in God. And God ended up, as a result, blessing him double. Um, after after he went through those trials and tribulations. It wasn't his fault. Now, he could have just said, I, I must be doing something wrong. I'm just going to just forget this, then trying to live right, and, and whatever, I give up. And for some of us, I mean, it would be hard to, to blame him as, as human beings, being compassionate and being able to understand, like, man, that guy went through everything. I can see where he'd want to just give up. But he didn't. He stuck with it. He stuck the course. And God bless him tremendously at the latter end of his life. So whatever it is that you might be going through right now, have that faith. Endure.
go through it and just and just understand that if you're doing what's right, now if you're doing what's wrong, maybe you are receiving something more you're doing wrong. I don't know. I mean, God, God will be a judge of that, but know for yourself. Say, hey, I, I, as far as I know, I'm not doing anything wrong. Keep doing it. Keep living in God's will. He's got a plan. He's got a plan for every single person's life that's here this morning. Every single one. He has a plan for your life. Try to, try to walk in those steps and let him lead you down that path. And um, so I hope, I hope that some, what was said this morning, you know, I hope I was able to dispel some of the myths that have been going on and some of the false teachings about the resurrection, about Easter. I mean, there's so many out there, so many different teachings. But if we just let the Bible be our authority, it, it really will clear itself up. Sometimes it's hard when you're taught a certain way for a long time to say, wait a minute, that, you know, You've been, you've been taught and taught and taught a certain way. You've got to be able to just let the Bible say, look, well, is this really what it says or not? And be able to honestly look at God's word and say, is this true or not? Um, that was really the point of this sermon. Hopefully I could, I could help clear things up for you and just show you, like, you know, some basic truths out of the Bible about the resurrection, about the Passover, and about Jesus Christ rising again from the dead. But let's have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you so much for this opportunity to preach. God, thank you for everyone that showed up here this morning on, on Easter Sunday, dear Lord, to, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you so much for loving us tremendously, to be willing to go through everything that you did and, and to die for us sinners who we don't, we don't even deserve it, dear Lord, but you, but you love us so much that you gave us a free gift. And we are incredibly thankful for that gift, dear God. We, we love you for it. And um, I pray that you please just bless us this afternoon, as, uh, as we go our separate ways, watch over us, keep us from evil, dear Lord, and help us to just dig into your word and to rely on the Bible as our source for all of our, our truth and knowledge, dear God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.